So hello and welcome to the Lewis Nichols Show. I'm really excited to bring on my next guest today, the brilliant Jim Davidson. How are you? Well, I'm okay, apart from being in Zoom world. I know, you were just saying before we, uh, we come on that it's kind of going to be exciting when lockdown's finished and we're away from these online meetings and interviews and doing things the, the traditional way. Yeah, it's uh, it's not good. It, this is God's way of proving that uh, working from home is never going to happen. Uh, whoever invented this Zoom, it needs thrashing. <laughs> yeah, I, I want to start off. Um, a couple of years ago, I was in Truro and I interviewed a, a very good friend of yours, Jeffro. Um, and he spoke so highly of you. Uh, and he said that he yeah. always remembers that you said to him, if there was a school of comedy, uh, they would put you on and say this is how not to do it uh, and he he was in, in stitches when he was uh, talking about that <laughs> yeah he's a good lad jethro he's very funny he's a very old-fashioned type of comedian but his timing is brilliant and he's picked himself a character which is himself he's made himself a caricature and he's well out of it and he's, he's still got his paper round money so he's a wealthy <laughs> boy <laughs> Uh, I mean, he, he actually said that you gave him the best advice he's ever had in his career, which was um, he, he was doing some comedy at the time. And you said to him, look, you're mimicking other people. You're not being yourself. You need to go forwards, not backwards. And he said that's the best advice he had ever received in, in his career. And it was down to you. Well, we, we became mates. I discovered him, sort of. He was doing warm-ups for a TV show, and I got him on tour with me, and then I got him at... at um, and then I got him on the Des O'Connor show, and then there was no looking back. But we've been friends forever. He's, a, he's the first one to offer any help for veterans or charities that I'm doing. He's a great man. Well, I mean, I wanted to go back to, to you, really, because you dominated the television scene, uh, for, you know, for over three decades uh, with primetime television. And I wanted to go back and ask you where you believe your big break actually came from. So if I was to ask you now, where was that moment that you considered your, your big break? Where, where was that? And, you know, what show? New Faces, the 13th of June, 1976. It's sort of like what the young people now would watch, uh, uh, The X Factor or Britain's Got Talent. Well, I won that. A couple of times and then I came runner up. Uh, but during the night with on, I, Benny Hill had taken a liking to my style and, and spoke to a producer at Thames Television, which got me on the road to light entertainment. Now, unfortunately, there was a technical issue there uh, on Zoom, so we are pleased to be joined uh, back again with Jim Davidson. Now, Jim, you were talking just before we got cut off there about uh, Ustream, this new service that you're on, putting out brand new episodes. So tell everyone how this came about uh, and what people can expect. <laughs> yeah, so I got together with a friend of mine and, uh, and recorded a couple of bits to camera. And um, he, he stuck it out wherever you stick these things out, streaming it. And... Um, we got 30 people signed up. And so we thought, well, we could make, make a few bob here. So within a couple of months, we had 2,000 subscribers. And then we got together and said, why don't we make a TV station? We called it Ustream. There's five channels on it, including a free channel for veterans. And I do three live shows a week. So not only are we a streaming uh, uh, company, we're a scheduled company as well, which is different to any of the others. So there's lots of things you can click on and watch when you watch. Uh, and, but there are new live shows on. There's three live shows a week, and, and we're called Ustream, and uh, people are loving it. And do you think that's very similar with kind of GB News in the sense that you're giving an alternative? Because at the moment, it seems you can't say anything without offending people or being accused of being racist, sexist. I mean, you've had that throughout your career. People use your oh. history against you. They'll, they'll find something that you might have done in the 80s and try and make it relevant again by branding you sexist, racist. I mean, it must be frustrating. Oh, I don't care. People can call me a murderer. I know I'm not a murderer. It's 
ridiculous how they can... Th th there are idiots out there. We all know that. And this is why people like GB News uh, and Ustream, uh, we govern ourselves. We don't set out to upset anybody unless you're particularly bonkers. And if you are bonkers and be upset uh, about certain things, uh, then go and be bonkers somewhere else. There is an off switch on everything, isn't there? Yeah. No. Uh, but, but having said that, I mean, we've, we, we do govern ourselves, and we say, well, we're not going to show that because it's a bit like... I, I, we're recording a series at the moment of veterans talking to one another, and some of the things they talk about, are, are, I've said, no, we're not going to show that because that's... If that would upset people a little bit. So, you know, it's not as if we just go on and bang away like we're a right-wing, uh, you know, bunch of mad people and we don't care what other people think. I think at the moment, Ustream, the unique selling point is me. But as people are seeing the channel and all the other programs we're putting on, it's rather like, uh, what's his name, Neil, is the boss of GB News, Andrew Neil. Uh, but he's not on there all the time, but you have a feeling that he's got a grip of it, and it's his idea, it's his baby. The unique selling point is this is a news channel that's put together with someone that, that can't be, you know, someone that you can trust, someone that's got no-nonsense news on there without opinion. So when people sign to Ustream, they think, oh, this is the stuff that, uh, you know, Jim's got his eye on this. You will not see any Michael McIntyres on Ustream. And do you work with any of your kind of uh, comedian friends that you've worked with for years? Do they make appearances uh, on the Ustream and your shows? Yeah, they do. And new ones as well. In fact, we're just about to film uh, a series with a young uh, comedian called Danny Posthill, who won Britain's Got Talent. There's nowhere for him to go. The, uh, the, the television companies don't really want performers. They want people that can read the autocue. And so we're going to be a door for, for people to show off people's talent. And we're also going to be a door to show people, uh, you know, like Jeff Stevenson, Bobby Davro, uh, Lloyd Hollett, all those guys that don't get any airspace at all. Well, they do with me, and, and, and people realise it just how funny these people are. And, and another thing I wanted to, to talk about, just because I thought it was absolutely incredible, was in 2014, uh, and it was just a prime example of people having this opinion on you before they got to know you or, or actually see you away from your shows. And it was when you went yeah. into Big Brother and you walked into that show getting a, a big amount of booze from the crowd, yet you went in there, showed the real you, and you won. And it yeah, was just I think the it's most... Yeah. I was, yeah, I mean, I, I just thought it was incredible. I just loved the way that you went in there and you were authentic and you were yourself and you actually won the entire show by a landslide. I mean, I wanted to get your thoughts because it was a difficult year for you prior to that so to come in and get that acceptance. oh yeah i got myself got myself arrested uh but uh, nothing came of that it was a year of worry and uh, actually i got on really well with the police it frightened the life out of me because i knew the police were under so much pressure to to arrest people when they didn't particularly want to arrest people but nevertheless it uh, it was a year's hard work and someone said it's serendipity i was arrested on the way to the big brother house 2013 or 2012, but I won it in 2013. So the difference with that is, is that I was on there being me, and it's very difficult to misquote someone when you're watching them live. Most of the bad press and stuff I've been getting lately is, is just that, fake news. It is fake news that people take something that you said and they turn it round to get a headline out of it, and that's happened the last two or three times. And I don't do anything about it because that's just the way it is. It goes with the job, you know. So people say, I think that that, that I didn't like that group diversity doing that dance. I don't uh, particularly like taking the knee, but I do think the BLM movement has, has, has made a difference. And so people will leave that last bit out and just say, I don't like diversity and I don't take the knee. Jim, that racist Jim Davis, and they, they won't print anything positive because positive doesn't make headlines, does it? And that's the thing, when you were, were in Big Brother, there was no, they couldn't, uh, obviously they get control of the edit, but we got to thankfully see the real you. And I, I think it's one of those shows where you get people from all walks of life and you had yourself in there, but then you have Dappy from, from Endub. I love 
him, definitely. I, and it was the most unlikely bromance I have ever seen on TV, <laughs> yet it was so gripping to watch because he just idolised you. He looked up to you as this kind of father figure. <laughs> yeah, I loved him. He, he was, he's, he's full of trouble, is Dappy. And uh, I got told off for doing a, a, what they said was a racist accent. And they said, you just did an impression of a black man. I said, I didn't know I was doing Dappy. <laughs> and, he's, and he's white. <laughs> Oh, they are funny. They are so funny. You know, most of it, well, t television now is run by young women. Basically, if you look at all the credits, Saturday night, which is all the same set, all the same lights, all the same ridiculous game show, it's produced by young people uh, who are of the female gender, if I'm allowed to say. And, and so I'm glad I'm not part of that. I now have a chance to make the programs I've always wanted to make. And not just with me. We'll be making a, a sitcom soon. We'll be making a drama series, a, a film series. I can't wait. It, it's been, the only thing that's stopping us is the amount of subscribers we have. The more subscribers that we get, and we're growing all the time, the more money we can spend on making the TV programs. So it's great fun. It's superb. Now I, just, um, I don't want to go too much into it, but I just wanted to go back very quickly to the, the point you mentioned before going into Big Brother and the tough year that you had with the arrest. Now, yeah. I know that there were other comedians, such as Freddie Starr, that was also arrested, but he was actually cleared of all charges, yet it, it really affected him health-wise. Um, well, and, the, pro the problem with Fred, if I might jump in, yeah. that he, he was speaking to me all the time. When we, he phoned me up, and he got a terrible stutter as Fred. And he said, oh, oh you, you're not t t t t talking to them, are you? I said, no, Fred, I'm not. Uh, but I was. I was literally helping the police with their inquiries. I was doing the inquiries for the police. They said, oh, thanks very much, Jim. That's very much doing that. And so Freddie then got a no further action, which means that they that, that basically we're not charging you. But that wasn't enough for Fred. He was so upset and, and dismayed by the fact that that young lady allegedly said that he did certain things, that he took her to court, to a civil court, and the judge didn't find in Freddie's favour. And I think that's what killed him. I don't think it was the arrest that did it. I just think you, that it was the absolute disgust that Freddie had, that he was unfairly uh, accused of something. And he didn't just take it on the chin like I did and got on with life. He wanted to uh, to get out there and get the front page saying Freddie Starr was definitely innocent of all charges. Uh, and, and that didn't go in his favour. I mean, I just think it's wrong in this day and age that the press have the ability to, to publicise a name on front page like, I mean, you were, Freddie, you were all front page of the papers. Yet this was just an allegation that had no um, evidence to support it. I mean, that must be infuriating for, for that to happen. It is infuriating, and the police told me, they said, our bosses have told us that these people must be whatever they say, the accuser, or the victim, as they were called, uh, must be treated as they are telling the absolute truth, unless it can be proved different. And I said, that's a bit of a wrong way round, isn't it? They said, well, that, that's the way it goes. Uh, as I say, but what could the police have done? When people complain, uh, the police have to take action. But to be honest, and they told me afterwards, and the boss of the, the you treating, the, the previous boss told me, they arrested you, Jim, without any investigation at all because you were going into the Big Brother house and they didn't want any headlines while you were in there for a month. So they arrested me and then thought, right, what are we going to do with him? So there you go, that is a bit wrong. Uh, and, and of course, if you look at the newspapers, they've got to fill 365 days, haven't they? They've got to find yeah. headlines, they've got to find something. They've got to find these quirky stories and these horrendous stories, most of the time with no truth in them at all. I mean, thankfully, you you know, you were clear you went on to Big Brother and there were so many quotes that I just remember from your time in there. And one of them was when I think it was Louisa uh, asked you, would you sleep with Linda Nolan? And you turned around. It's not the ex is it? Yeah, it is. And it was just the best <laughs> quote I have ever heard on Celebrity Big Brother. And I remember it to this day because I just kept rewinding it and I couldn't believe you had the balls to say that in front of her. Well, I, as you say, I was just myself. And I did love it in there. Once once I got through that initial, oh, God, this is awful. Because, in a way, you sell your soul to the devil, don't you? I was talking to myself, I'm in here with a load of Z-listers. Is this what it's come to? You know, 
padlock to poor old Linda Nolan. I hope she's uh, doing well. She's battling with cancer yeah. at the moment, and I, I say a little prayer for her every now and then. But we didn't get on in that house at all. She made it quite obvious. And I thought, oh, here we go. Uh, but the public, for once, came out on my side because they could see the truth. The public loves the truth. I think they they like reading scandal and gossip, and they like watching Love Island and trivia. But when it comes to it, I think what the public want is the truth. And I mean, another show I always remember you on was, of course, Howl's Kitchen. And I mean, it's fair to say I think the budget was spent on booking you, because looking at the, some of your fellow contestants, um, there was a big. Well, there's a story to this because I bumped into uh, Marco Pierre White in Dubai, and he said, "Please come and do it with me, please, please." And so I said, okay, all right, I will. So my manager called me the next day and said that they've just, Hell's Kitchen have been on. Marco says you're going to do it. I said, oh, blimey. Tell them we want so many thousands of pounds that they'll say no. And the buggers said yes. So <laughs> in I went. In I, and the worst thing about that is that I was getting on quite well with that Brian Dowling, the gay chap. But they edited it. We had a bit of an argument because we were all drunk. And they edited it as if it was an argument about being gay. And and that was unforgivable, really. I mean, it really was unforgivable what they did. And, and they said, well, you're going to have to leave because what you said was offensive. I said, well, don't show that bit. Yeah. Cut that bit out. It, it's not live. You cut that bit out if you think it's going to cause offence. Ah. Well, they didn't know where to, what to do when I said that to them. And I said, if it, they said, well, that will cause offence. Well, you've caused offence, so we're going to have to ask you to leave. I said, listen, I told you last night I'm leaving anyway because I'm fed up with it all. But if you don't want to cause offence, don't show it. So I knocked the ball back over the net. But of course, they chose to show it because that's exactly what they want to show. And they edited it to make it look terrible. I think that's one thing that in your career that you prove is that you you do have to have a, a thick skin to, to be in this industry because you, they yeah. put you in so many situations to try and make you look bad, make your character look bad, yet you bounce back and you just let it ride over you where a lot of people would let it get to them. Well, do you hear the other thing the other week with the Gary Glitter thing? Do you, you get that one? No, I haven't. Right, so I'm down in Dorset on my boat with my brother Bill and another guy and we're having a, a four-bottle of wine lunch, which was rather nice, and the newspaper turned up, the Dorset Echo, which is great. Paper. So I invited the uh, reporter on board, and then I said, bring the rest of the office. So a photographer came, and the editor came, and we sat there. And they said, have you been to, to Weymouth a lot? I said, yeah, well, when I formed Care After Combat, we look after veterans in prison. And I went up to that uh, HMP Vern up there, uh, Her Majesty's Prison Vern. And they said, oh, Gary Glitter's in there. Did you see him? I said, actually, he tried to get into one of our meetings, and I said, he can't come in because it's veterans only. And they said, oh. How is he? I said, well, the briefly that I spoke to him, um, he said, he told me that he was, you know, remorseful about what he'd done, what an idiot he'd been, and that he'd be glad to get out and, uh, and start a new life. Right, so they printed that in the paper. Then the other papers picked it up and thought, hmm, here we go, what can we do with this? And it said, Jim Davidson went to HMP Vern to visit Gary Glitter and says that he is remorseful and looking forward to starting a new life. Now, that's not what I said at all. That is a complete lie, isn't it? Definitely. Um, that's just the way for them to... Yeah, yeah, I know. I went there to visit veterans, which is what I do, but that's not good enough for the newspapers. That's good news. What they want is bad news. Gary Glitter's friend, as it turned into. Of course, then all the trolls all start up, and it's uh, it's not good. It, it, it's, it's bloody crazy. But what can you do? I mean, you get the odd moment like this where you can have a bit of a moment. But I'm not going to walk around with the banner saying, poor me, you know, why is everyone picking on me? It pays well to be picked on. <laughs> well, I was going to say, I mean, I'm not sure if, you, if you've noticed. I mean, I'm only 28 um, years old. But I, I find sometimes when I've watched previous interviews with you, a younger journalists, tr they try to get you to say things that might get them in the press to, to further themselves uh, and I, I feel like sometimes people get you on their shows just to boost their own profile which I think is wrong because I've got you on today because I think you're an incredible comedian with a great story and career to talk about um, yeah. but does that ever frustrate you when, because I've seen you on, it was on YouTube and there was a journalist that wanted you to apologise for something you said years ago and it was... Oh that idiot, yeah, yeah. Bacon. Yeah <laughs> Yeah, it's great fun. Well, listen, I don't mind. It goes with the job. All I've got to do now is concentrate on trying to remember that I am a comedian when I go back out on tour. In a couple of weeks,
weeks' time, I start my British tour. And nine gigs in the summer and about 31 gigs in the autumn. And as of this moment, I'm terrified. I've not been on stage for 18 months, so the first week or so is going to be hysterical. <laughs> the audience are going to know more about comedy than I do at this moment <laughs> in time. Well, we're lucky that you're actually going to be here in Cheltenham uh, on November the 2nd in the, in the lovely Cheltenham Town Hall. And it's great that theatres are open again because I think people have missed the ability to go out and, and just relax and enjoy themselves. So I think the tour is going to do incredibly well for you, the fact that you are going out to so many places, towns uh, and cities. So what can people expect? I know you said that you've not done it for, for a while and you know, there might be some nerves there, but what, what can people expect from the tour? Well, uh, it's interesting you mentioned Cheltenham because that is quite a big old barn of a room. I uh, I did two nights there on the trot and I went back on the second night and I could still hear my act echoing round from the night before. <laughs> but it's also a wonderful atmosphere in there. What can they expect from me is just to walk on and have a look at what the world is doing now and ridicule it. And to ridicule myself and talk about my failings and my uh, and the way life is. I, I say to people that God has a way of making old people not frightened of dying by giving them young people. So you, when you look round at all the all the woke stuff and all the political correctness and all the mad people that are around saying you, I want to be a man and a woman together, it makes it okay to die, doesn't it? You think, <laughs> right, that's it, I'm off. <laughs> I like the way. <laughs> that's a good way of looking at it. Yeah, that's it. What do you care about all these woke things and, and snowflakes? I don't care because I'll be dead soon. And quite frankly, I can't wait. Do, do you know the great thing, um, and I don't know what you, you think about it, but when you do a show and you see the variations of age in the audience, so you've got the younger people, the people that would have watched you in the 80s and the 90s, does yeah. that ever surprise you that your comedy is get, getting new fans with younger generations? Does, do you ever look at a crowd and think, wow, you know, you wouldn't have been born when I was doing this No, I, I do do that, and especially with the young young blokes and young women. Young women have always got their hands to their mouth saying, I can't believe you just said that, but they're laughing their head off. They laugh their heads off, and of course, my, mum and dad or the older people sit there saying, go on, Jim, you tell them, boy. I, I sort of have a responsibility to deliver, to deliver the best performance I can, so those people think, wow, you know, that's just blown me away. The, the, people expect a comedian to be funny. But if you take him three steps further than that, then you've won. Well, I'm really excited. I'm going to be there um, myself, and we've got links uh, to the tickets that are on sale on our website and on the radio right. station. Well, come and have a drink. That'll be fantastic. And you know, I'm going to need one before I go on. I'll tell you <laughs> that. <laughs> But, you know, it, it honestly has been a pleasure. And I think I, I've wanted you on the show for such a long time because I've just loved the way that you bounce back from people trying to get a reaction, from people putting yeah. words in your mouth and editing you the way that they want you to be edited. Yeah, because it I makes... get that all the time. But, but you know, that's, that's the game. And I know Jeffro Jeffro will be very happy that I've got you on the show because he did. It was just funny that he said that you had said if there's a way to do comedy, they'll put you on stage and say this is how not to do it. And he said you. <laughs> it was in a place called Newquay, and he said that you gave him the best advice he had ever received. And he spoke quite highly of you. It was about a good five minute chat during an interview that yeah. he just spoke about you. Yeah, he was a great guy. We both did a gig in Wigan one night. He went on before me and died terribly. And then. Uh, by the time I was 10 minutes into my act, he was 50 miles down the motorway <laughs> gone. <laughs> and I said to him, by the time you got to Bristol, I'd finished my act and died as well. So don't feel so bad about it, Jeff. Bless him. One thing I wanted to quickly ask you is, do you get asked to do a lot of reality TV shows such as Strictly Come Dancing and those other types of shows? No, not really. Uh, the 12-year-olds don't want me on there at all. Uh, and I wouldn't do them anyway. I get asked to do a lot of guest shows on comedy things, but no, I've got my own TV channel. I'm a Ustream boy. And that's a, a thing as well, because that's so current. So you've, you've managed, again, to reinvent yourself to appeal to the, the current uh, audience. Yeah, which I'm is... a TV mogul. <laughs> <laughs> well, Listen, mate, it's been great talking to you, and I'll see you in, in Cheltenham. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for your time today. Cheers, matey. Yes, Ta-da, boy. Thank you. Bye.